Hello, I'm Nathan Robinson, editor of Current Affairs, and I am here today with one of my favorite writers and thinkers, uh, Professor Adolf Reed, uh, a professor emeritus of political science That's at correct. the University of Pennsylvania, and the author of a stack of <laughs> books, uh, which I have here, including uh, Stirrings in the Jug, Black Politics in the Post-Segregation Era, uh, The Jesse Jackson Phenomenon, and uh, my personal favorite, Class Notes, oh, uh, which is an enduring classic, as you can see uh, from my, uh, my endless, endless <laughs> post-its. Um, and um, there's a lot that I want to talk to you about, but I guess I want to start because I was, I was just, I was just rereading Class Notes, and I think. I was trying to think, you know, of what the common themes that I see mm -hmm. running through your writing are. And I mean, this is, you call this book Posing as Politics and Other Thoughts on the American Scene. And, and one of the things that I think is, is central to what you write about is what politics is and what it isn't. And what a political movement does look like right. and what it doesn't look like. And how many things look like they are meaningful political action or are treated as if they are right. meaningful political action, um, but really aren't and can kind of delude us into thinking that we are making progress when we aren't. And, you know, for <laughs> 30 years through your writing, from the Jesse Jackson phenomenon <laughs> yeah. through the you know, Million Man March right. to Obama, right. you've been sort of documenting these phenomena that look like large-scale social change right. without actually moving power. Right. I think that's very well put. Yeah, and no, I think so. And I mean, from one perspective, it could be kind of depressing that I've been saying the same thing for over 30 years. Um, uh, and at the same time, like I, I uh, was just saying to somebody, I think my son a few days ago, that um, as much as I've railed against what I've called the myth of the spark, right, that this the tendency to think that some, some exogenous intervention is going to happen to knock the shackles off people's eyes and the masses will then rise, I realized that at least since 2016, I've been uh, charting, as it were, the... Um, increasing or increasing ideological boldness from on the part of the vocal uh, segments of the um, people of color professional uh, and a managerial class what I often abbreviate as a POC PMC uh, making clear who make clearer and clearer you know, almost daily I don't know if you've been following like the hype for the essence uh, festival here coming up. Oh, yeah. But they make Michelle it, Obama, guest of honor. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. But they make it clearer, like on a daily basis, that, that their politics is exclusively a class politics, right? And, I've, and I realized that I've caught myself thinking, uh, well, surely, like they're so brazen now um, that, that, that it'll be clear. And it just, it, it, it just finally hit me, well, that's only another version of the myth of the spark because there's no objective moment when a crisis occurs, but so I guess that makes me feel a little better over the last or about the last thirty okay. years. <laughs> okay, but I want I want to dive a little more clearly mm -hmm. into, into what you mean thereby uh, is oh, sure. a, a a class politics. One one of the things that that also recurs is that your your point that one of your central obje objections to identity politics or race reductionism mm -hmm. is that it obscures really, really important divides within black right. politics. Right. And that those divides are central to understanding black politics. And it sort of treats um, black political actors and black people as a, a hive mind monolith. Right. And it's, and right. it's racist in right. its way. Um, and when you break it down, the, the, the class divides within black politics are extremely, extremely important to understanding what is going on. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, I mean, you could be my press agent, basically. Uh, <laughs> I've been, I mean, I've just been re <laughs> reading the books. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, and, and among the ways that, uh, the, that the class divides are consequential are, for instance, um, the current um, obsession with the New Deal as racist, right? And with the idea of that universal programs, right, are um, fundamentally racist because they don't target black people in, in particular and black people don't get anything out of them. Um, so, so, but the fact of the matter is that 
black people got a lot out of the GI Bill, black people got a lot out of the WPA, black people got a lot out of, out of the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, and that racial disparity uh, isn't in the distribution of of, of, of uh, you know, benefits and bad, you know, good things and bad things uh, isn't necessarily like the end of the story, right? There's a lot more more that's at stake, um, and and the objection, for instance, like Joy Ann Reed just kind of pop, pops to my mind as, as a universal symbol of the class, but uh, but um, 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 this notion that Medicare for all, right? Like a single mm -hmm. payer healthcare system wouldn't do anything for black people because it's not race targeted. The idea that free public college wouldn't do anything for black people because it's not race, race targeted mm -hmm. are clearly class-based programs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so, and, and, uh, and of course, free college, I mean, we've had uh, uh, our, one of our, our, our financial editor, Sparky Abraham, has written mm -hmm. about the way that um, student debt, because student debt is disproportionately held right. by people right. of color, right. uh, free college actually right. is something that disproportionately benefits right. uh, no, no, people no, of color totally. because they're the ones that are screwed over most right. by uh, right. uh, the, the way we finance uh, college. But, but then let me, let me ask you, I mean, I think... I mean, I, I think the the justification for universal programs like Medicare for All and Free College um, is, is 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 sound mm -hmm. um, uh, completely. But I, I would then ask you whether you think there are any <sighs> programs that need to be race targeted. So, like, you mm -hmm. know, let's bring up reparations, right? right? Which is right. you know, which a number of people on the left have been saying should be a, a, a part of. Right. The left agenda because it specifically addresses a giant racial injustice that has never been corrected. And I was talking to last week uh, Kianga Yamato Taylor, mm -hmm. who was mm -hmm. telling me, "Well, you know, you you can't fix the racial wealth gap unless you have some kind of program that targets a a, a deprivation that was." racial right. and and right. is there a way to close the racial wealth gap through mm -hmm. things that are just universal right well it's interesting because i was just on a uh, on an npr show in philadelphia with kianga a few weeks ago they they call it a debate i called it a discussion but on, uh, but on the reparations issue and um the first thing i said there was that you know like i was out of the country um around the turn of the century someplace where i didn't have um regular American news and uh, internet access. And I was kind of blown away um, to get back and find out that the reparations issue had popped up and, and had gone live and was all over C-SPAN and everything. I couldn't figure out where it came from because I knew it, right? It, 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 it had appeared on the public radar screen for a couple of minutes at the end of the 1960s when James Foreman uh, made the and the National Black Economic Development Conference, or or whatever they called it, made the uh, demands to I think the Riverside Church or some liberal Protestant church in New York. But and then it went away and it retreated back to you know the street corners and the soapboxes where you would have found it prior to 1969, and it was there for 20 years, mm -hmm. um, and I couldn't. Um, I couldn't figure out what was going on seeing like um, you know, respectable professors on on a judicious panels talking about this issue because my question was always first question I said this to Kianga too has always been the same and I've never gotten gotten what I think is a satisfactory attempt to answer it even okay. right which is how can you imagine in a majoritarian democracy putting together a political alliance that's capable of prevailing on an issue like this that nobody gets anything out of except black people. And that's mm -hmm. even before all of the other questions, like what counts as reparations? I mean, who, who gets what? I mean, should, should, should the ADOS, uh, you know, the American descendants of slaves line be, be uh, followed? Uh, what, what, what about all of the other harms? And, and so there's all that. Right. Yeah. Um, I do think that just from a pragmatic political point of view, the pragmatic political question trumps it. Right. Uh, and I know the response has always been, 
well, but don't you think black people deserve something? And I said, well, yeah, of course. Like, but that's not the issue, right? The issue is what is possible to win and how you can win it. But it even gets more, and maybe we can pursue this, but I think that's also fundamentally more of a class program than it is a, a racial program. Well, can, can I ask you though, mm -hmm. uh, what you think, because it strikes me that a lot of the things that we demand on the left are mm -hmm radical and require right. shifting public right. consciousness. And right. often at the beginning are things that we can't imagine, or it's very difficult to imagine happening. And, and, and the fact that the majority may be against you means that you have to work really, really hard and it's a long, right. slow process. Right. Um, but that if that's what would constitute justice, um, it's sort of necessary because, I mean, there are lots of things that um, majorities oppose, but we believe in protecting sure. the minorities. So how, sure. do you, how do you think okay. about things that are sort of practical mm -hmm. utopianism versus right. things that are utopian right. utopianism? Yeah, uh, but yeah, I hear you. And in fact, like to go back to the Marty Moss Cohen show, uh, I mean, Kianga brought up um, you know, the case of abolitionism. But, and that's a nice case because like it shows the problem with, with the argument um, that um, abolitionism didn't get anywhere really um, except to piss off the slaveholders un, until um, um, political circumstances shifted to, um, to, to ad advance um, you know, the, the position of, of political anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. Right, activists, and 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 anti-slavery um, northerners were opposed to slavery for a lot of reasons. Some of which, of course, uh, I mean, overlapped. Uh, I mean, the abolitionist moral concern, but for other reasons that they could see their own interest in. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, both um, you know, commitment to an ideal of free labor, um, as sometimes racist and sometimes not. Um, and anxiety about um, being flooded by a degraded um, I mean, labor force. A lot of other things have been like that too, right? The victories of the civil rights movement, for instance, right, right or another, um, uh, and the CIO. But the thing is, though, that for reparations in particular, what we would have to do is convince people who, whose main experience is decline of, or one of whose main or mm -hmm. principal experiences is declining standard of living and increasing economic in, mm -hmm. in, in insecurity to go to the wall fighting for an agenda that they, by definition, wouldn't, wouldn't get anything from. And I just don't mm -hmm. see how it's possible. I mean, that's, do you think, do you think there are ever uh, issues that, where you just have to say, well, I mean, is it ever possible to mobilize around something that is not in the self-interest of the, I mean, we don't want to always have to appeal to self-interest. There are things where we're going to have to pursue things where people are going to have to give something up or. Well, look, I mean, my take on this is that, um, so like I read Aesop's fables a lot when I was mm -hmm. a little kid. And, and my favorite one, or well, one of my favorite ones, was the one about the contest um, you know, between the wind and, and the sun. Uh, and uh, they were boasting back and forth at each other and they determined to test their prowess against um, a wayfarer um, who, 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 who was walking along the road and whichever one could get him to take his coat off uh, would, would be the more powerful. So the wind blew and blew and blew and and uh, no matter how much harder the wind blew, like um, I mean, the traveler just kind of pulled his, his his coat more more and more tightly around himself. And then when the sun took its turn, right, it just sort of uh, began to radiate um, more and more warmth. And the traveler uh, eventually took the coat off on his own. Uh, my approach to politics, and this goes back to the question mm. of what counts as a movement mm. and and what doesn't. Is um, is the project of trying to fasten a broad-based political alliance, in which different people and constituencies can not only see a, a vehicle for pursuing their their own interests, but can come to understand that um, a condition for for advancement of their own interests is equal commitment to advancement of their partner's interests, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so from that perspective, mm -hmm. 
Um, and like this, th this also connects with one of the sort of um, standard, almost pro forma beefs that I have about what's what's called identity politics, which is that I I just don't understand. I've said this for more than thirty years too. How we build solidarity by going around the room to stress uh, how profoundly we actually differ from from one does, another. Does that mean that the black white wealth gap is sort of in inevitable then, or is there something that can address that particular? Like well, yeah, and that's a good question too. Um, I just saw a recent study by um, a guy named Alaprantis and his colleagues that argues in a seemingly per persuasive way that actually the root of the wealth gap is fundamentally the income gap, right? And uh, what's interesting about that is it is that um, well, in the first place, like the argument seems seems plausible, although I'm having difficulty reconstructing it in in, yeah. in in my head off the top of my head 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 now. But they purport to show through experiments that if you close the income gap uh, substantially, right, like at any given point, then the wealth gap that would take 500 years to close can be closed in like 30, right? Mm -hmm. Now that. Now, the Alaprantis study has been met with, um, I wouldn't say a firestorm, because yeah. there are no weapons right, for the firestorm, but uh, circumspection because, you know, for predictable reasons. One of them is that people who study the wealth gap are committed to the wealth gap being causally meaningful. Um, so, like, and I mean, just as academics, but I mean, also, uh, you, you know, there's, there's an embedded um, ideological vision that's sort of smuggled in into the wealth gap construct, right? Like in this sense, um, what what what's the big penalty that that comes from the wealth gap, right? The big penalty comes from uh, limits of capital formation, mm -hmm. right? And rich black people talk about this all the time. Um, well, okay, so then what would capital formation do? Well, cap Capital or, or um, more um, repaired access to capital, right, um, comports with with a political ideal of um, of, of um, strict equality, real equality of opportunity being like the the mm -hmm. the fundamental mm -hmm. norm of social justice, right. Um, not and and it's like this difference that that my good friend Preston Smith has has and you harped on for a, a while now is the difference between the principles of a racial democracy and the principles of social democracy that 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 existed at a, um, at a in, in a state of de facto tension right in, uh, in black politics from the 30s through the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s. Uh, and I think kind of what we have here is like a conflict between two different ideals of social justice and two different ideals of social justice for black people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one of which uh, hinges on, on um, overcoming unjust Im Im impediments to upward mobility um, w uh, you know, within uh, American neoliberal capitalism and the other of which is, frankly, socialist. I want to talk to you about Obama because ah, okay. I have here one of my, <laughs> this is the, the, cla the prophecy. <laughs> oh yeah, the right. The prophecy <laughs> from 1996. Yep. Um, Actually it, written in 95, but, uh, 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 but no quibble. <laughs> in, and so here's, here's, here's the quote. Well, you don't mention him by name, but we all know who you're talking about. In Chicago, for instance, we've gotten a foretaste of the new breed of foundation-hatched black communitarian voices. One of them, a smooth Harvard lawyer with impeccable do-good credentials and vacuous to repressive neoliberal politics, has won a state senate seat on a base mainly in the liberal foundation and development world worlds. His fundamentally bootstrap line was softened by a patina of the rhetoric of authentic community, talk about meeting in kitchens, small-scale solutions to social problems, the predictable elevation of process over program, the point where identity politics converges with old-fashioned middle-class reform in favoring form over substance. I suspect that his ilk is the wave of the future in US black politics as in Haiti and wherever else the International Monetary Fund has sway. 
so far the black activist response hasn't been up to the challenge we have to do better and that was in fact Barack Obama yeah, oh, oh yeah 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 totally totally I tell you what happened well I mean I often say like it, it's it's in fact I always say that it's often more, more important um, to be in the right place at the right time and to keep your eyes open than it is to be smart and I lived in that state Senate district. I worked very closely with his predecessor in, in, in that seat. We'd actually had, had an organizing campaign going like in the state Senate district to try to do, do the equivalent of left inclined, but civic, uh, civic education right among the constituents about what the difference is between the state house and the state Senate, how a bill becomes a law, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then uh, you know, Barack popped up. I mean, nobody knew anything about him. I mean, nobody in the activist world had ever heard of him, had no connection to him. And it was just fascinating watching the um, Hyde Park liberal and foundation world get sort of, I don't know if I can say this, but kind of wet pantied over him. Uh, <laughs> if it's accurate. <laughs> and and it actually split, uh, what, I mean, split the left in that, Part, part of the city as well. My good friend and doctor uh, Quentin Young was was one of the stalwarts who who uh, who uh, supported uh, the incumbent, whose name uh, it was Alice Palmer. It was a very very good 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 person against Obama. And then someone and then we just kind of watched it play out over um, uh, um, you know the intervening decades. Uh, but yeah, I mean that was Obama. It sure was, and his tribe has indeed in, increased. The, I, I want to dwell on the line that the fundamentally bootstrap line was softened by a patina of the rhetoric of, of authentic community. It was interesting mm -hmm. that, you know, one of Obama's big pitches was that his roots were as a community organizer, right. that he right. came from supposedly the organizing right. world. Right. But actually, that was kind of, you point out, the, the opposite of the truth. And, the, and, the, and mm -hmm. the bootstrap thing you also dwell on in, you know, you wrote an essay that I have here in 2008 while he was actually running. Um, called Obama no, very simply, oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, what, what you talk about actually the, the way that he used fundamentally very conservative rhetoric, especially when he was talking to black audiences um, using the, uh, what you say is the victim blaming tough love message about behavioral right. pathology in black right. communities. Yeah, that was really striking. And I should take this moment too, I mean, just, 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 just to, um, um, offer like a moment of, of, I don't know what to call it, uh, I guess sadness at the passage of, of uh, Bruce Dixon, who, who just mm. died a couple of years ago, cause, because Bruce is one of the few uh, black commentary voices who, who um, uh, saw through Obama like all the way from, uh, from the beginning. But um, yeah, that, that was also uh, something to be noticed, right? And especially in the summer of 08, after he had, um, well, I mean, two things stood out. One, you know, after he had all but uh, officially sewn up uh, I mean, the nomination, um, he made an um, um, a, an immediate sharp right turn over the and like over the span of four or five days, just uh, weighed in um, on uh, the pending Supreme Court court decision um, that ultimately invalidated the Washington DC gun control statute and he was opposed to the statute, right? Um, I'm trying to remember what the other two, two were, um, but anyway, but what then got me though was, and perhaps most of all, like the Philadelphia speech that so many liberals touted as, as his acknowledgement of structural racism, right? Because he made a reference in passing to um, patterns of inequality that got formed in the 1930s and it had been and it had then been re uh, reproduced over time but the rest of the speech was um, was a version of the broke black people aren't worth anything right they need to modify their behavior they need to you know um, uh, uh, and I can't recall if this is when uh, the infamous cousin Pookie, was born, but as some friends of mine had pointed out, uh, you know, there's no way in the world that Obama ever had a cousin Pookie, right? Uh, but, but it was striking that Obama seemed to um, uh, burnish, if not to establish, his bona fides with the black political elite 
by giving the tough love speech, right? Mm -hmm. As if it were like a first person plural, right? That, that, that we have to tell our broke people to mm -hmm. do better, right? mm -hmm. but, you know, which is kind of striking. Well, and of course there was um, in, in that speech, the moment where he acknowledged that Jeremiah Wright uh, product of his time, but right. you know when he starts denouncing America for right. its various crimes abroad, right. uh, well, that goes right. a little—it's uh, going a little too far. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, that was another kind of um, um, telling moment, right? Because when, see, the thing was that when um, Obama um, emerged, right, from the cocoon, right, um, the wet panty crowd uh, had. The future that they had uh, imagined for him was to succeed daily as mayor of Chicago. And in fact, there was this moment for several years in the late 90s when um, he and you know, Jesse Jackson Jr. were like understood in those circles as sort of friendly rivals. Um, as to, and then the question was, well, which one of them was actually going to be the one uh, that replaced daily? Now, the reality is, uh, that the that, that the farther you moved up the food chain of uh, of the Democratic Party, uh, I mean Chicago liberals, the clearer the understanding was that that Daly's uh, your replacement was going to come pretty much with with Daly's blessing. So it's not like either of them was likely to lead an insurgent movement to oust oust Daly, but. But that just said something about um, you know what people perceive the the horizon of political opportunity for him to be. And the reason I mention that uh, is is that f from the standpoint of a political career that was articulated toward toward Chicago, um, then the Jeremiah Wright connection and the Bill Ayers connection made all the sense in the world. Ayers was completely re rehabilitated, like in Chicago politics. I mean, how could he not be? He's a rich man's son, and he's come back home, and he's doing the things that rich, rich men do, uh, or rich men's sons do, anyway. Um, and, and Wright uh, had access to um, a, a black political base on the south side of Chicago that, that Obama had no connection to on, on his own. So... If you're keeping your eye on the main chance, and you know as you move seamlessly upward, um, and Chicago seemed like the next, oh, uh, I mean, the Chicago mayoralty seemed like the next move, um, then both those alliances made perfect sense. And then uh, when he suddenly becomes like Wall Street's favorite candidate, right after he uh, wins the U.S. Senate seat and and, and uh, Axelrod and Emmanuel and, and uh, those guys get him positioned, um, you know, to give the star or to do, you know, the star turn at the 2004 convention. Well, then all of a sudden he's a national figure now and, and, and he's vulnerable to the right uh, for b both those associations. And th this is well before your time, but one of the things that impressed me about Ed, Ed Koch when he was mayor, I mean, not in a good way, but that he didn't waste a moment uh, cutting the hearts out of, of, of his allies who became li liabilities. In fact, what, one of them, Donald Manis, I think was the Queens borough president, literally fell on a butcher knife in his kitchen, right? Um, to take one for the team or maybe, you know, with, with without consent. And so, I mean, from that perspective, um, I mean, I know a lot of people got really uh, um, exercised about watching Obama turn, turn on his allies, but, you know. I mean, one of the uh, things that sort of comes across in your, in your Obama essay is, yeah, while it's true that, it, you know, it's re remarkable to have written in 1996 about exactly what would happen, it's also the case that, like, all you needed to do was listen to Obama yes. to realize that he wasn't a leftist. He and that's the point. Disguise that, right. it at no, all. That's right. He was very upfront about that fact, right. even though, right. as he as, as you say, you know, the, the rhetoric about meeting in people's kitchens and, and community organization. You know, I the, the thing that first made, made me <laughs> skeptical is a tiny thing, but I think it's significant because I I mean I went to law school and at law school uh, you do two summer internships mm -hmm. and the people 
Usually the pattern is you come in and you really want to do public interest work. So your first mm -hmm. summer you do public interest, you say, right. I really want to do good. Right. And then the second summer you go to a, a fancy law firm. Right. Obama went to the fancy law firm his first summer. <laughs> and the people who go to the fancy law yeah. firm the first summer, yeah, yeah. they're not even pretending. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a very good point. And I didn't notice that, but yeah, well, it's telling. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely telling. I mean, and my, and my good friend, uh, um, my good friend Ian Shapiro is a political theorist, but he went to the Yale Law School after he uh, completed his PhD, um, you know, often says that, look, the thing you have to remember is that what the fancy law schools do is equip you to argue persuasively that what is manifestly not X is somehow like indeed X. And that's right. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's what Obama has or did all the way through, through his political career. I right. can definitely argue that not X is X. Oh, That's like oh my I'm sure one you can. <laughs> <laughs> We're very good at that. But you know what you pointed out in your you did the this uh, Harper's um, this big Harper's cover story mm -hmm. in 2014 called <laughs> kind of depressingly nothing left. <laughs> um, and you and you sort of present Obama as the culmination of a tendency that had been going for a long time. The sort mm -hmm. of tr final triumph of Reaganism. And what mm -hmm. you said is that for most of the 20th century, there had in fact been a left. It hadn't been a right. successful left right. necessarily, right. but it had existed. But during, but from the Reagan to Obama, the left sort of just withers and dies. And by mm -hmm. 2014, when you're writing, I mean, it's a year before Bernie Sanders' mm -hmm. campaign, right. I mean, that's a very bleak moment. Right. No, absolutely. Well, well yeah, no, it definitely was. And look, I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's still bleak. I mean, Trump's, Trump's in the right. White House, <clears throat> and uh, many of the Democrats are fully committed to doing whatever they can to put him back there. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's a, well, well, actually, and like bits of that essay uh, also came out of the first chapter of what was, what began as a book, um, I, well, what is my long-suffering book that began uh, as a book on Obama mania that um, Tariq Ali at, at Universo had approached me to write this thing just after the election. And I was kind of reluctant um, because I didn't want to do an Obama book, but I thought, okay, I can do a book on Obama mania because one of the uh, head scratching moments of this phenomenon was seeing how many people whom you would think based on their own histories and practice would know better got completely swept up in ridiculous hype about this this guy. And I started trying to work on it. Um, and I did like a counter um, um, a counter cyclical pattern. It's almost like the poor man's version of The Shining. But um, to try to get myself to start writing, I went up and spent uh, my Christmas break in Brattleboro, uh, near Vermont, in a Holiday Inn Express right across the street from a drugstore, or, or from a grocery store. Uh, where it was like you know they have beautiful bed and breakfasts in Vermont. Oh you no, know I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, but 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 I wanted the austerity, okay. right? Uh, so I wanted like I don't even normally use a microwave, but I would like go <laughs> go and get Amy's burritos. <laughs> I've had a lot of in like burritos. the two degree weather, and then come back and live off those. Oh, but and then that summer um, I did the same thing, but for six weeks in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, it was like 105 mm -hmm. degrees every day, but there was also a supermarket right by. But anyway, um, I found that I, I was first um, felt anxious that Obama actually might break the mold and do something that I would not have imagined he would do, maybe find his, his closet FDR or something and stand for something. So I felt that, uh, so I felt kind of uh, you know, anxious, just kind of waiting to see what happened every day. And then I finally said, well, look, the book I really wanted to do and the book that answering this, this question, that is, why did so many people who should have known better get swept up in the hype? Uh, the book that's really uh, required to answer the question is a different sort of book, and it's a book on the, uh, on the decline and transformation of the left in the U.S. since the end of World War II, which is the book I'm trying to finish now. Uh, but, but, but I mentioned the, that because uh, the first chapter, which I need to revise because it was full of piss and vinegar about Obama, uh, has some um, sections from that chapter are in that article. I haven't looked at it in a while, but, 
but but attempts to address what there was about what's happened to the left that um, even led you know sort of serious longtime veteran uh, uh, activists to to get um, to delude themselves and to delude themselves as militants, right? I mean, it's not just that they they liked Obama uh, and uh, supported Obama, but they were almost like the Gestapo for Obama during the campaign, right? Yeah, I wouldn't quite use that term, but, but um, well, I mean, I, I just reviewed the memoirs of these uh, of these guys who worked in the administration. Oh, so that, oh, they worked oh, in the administration. oh, yeah, and right, one of right, them yeah, says right, explicitly. Yeah. He says basically, I. My friends all started to say, you know, you've become this unthinking Obama bot. And it was kind of true. He yeah. goes, I was an evangelist for Obama. Right. I, I, you right. know, That's I didn't really know what he stood yours, for, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, but I just liked him right. so much right. and I became obsessed with him and he had this incredible power. I mean, I'm, I'm a little sympathetic to this because it, some of it comes out of desperation, right? Yeah. Some of these, I mean, you, you point all through your work, as I say, to things that aren't political movements mm -hmm. that want to be political movements, but some of the time it's because there isn't a political, no one right. knows what to do. So they right. cling to the thing that seems like politics. It right. seems like it's advancing justice. And this, right. you know, the election of Obama seemed like a very radical right. transformation that we could, and once it became within the realm of possibility, mm -hmm. it's understandable why people said, wow, we can do this incredibly transformative right. thing. Well, true, but, but, uh, but see, to me, that's the most depressing thing, <laughs> right. thing in the world. I mean, that's like frighteningly, I mean, depressing, right? I mean, that's like, that's being in that position, right? Where you feel so desperate, right? Um, that you have to turn to a fantasy, right? Um, to get some solace. To me, is like the same thing as, well, I don't know. I mean, that, you know, you know, I was raised Catholic, so I was baptized too young, young before I knew, knew anything about it or... Uh, or or had space uh, to think about it, but it feels like sort of um, leaping into a religious commitment, right? Uh, because you can't face uh, um, you know the world as it is, which to me feels like the same thing as being buried alive, right? You know what I mean? I mean like the so I mean the idea that and look, I mean there are moments when 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 the political situation is absolutely hopeless, right? I mean, there mm -hmm. are such moments, and that's, that's when uh, you assassinate the fascist judge, right? Or, 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 or uh, make a, um, you know, flip the bird to the eagle that's coming down, down on you. Uh, but, but I don't want to rush to that moment, right? There's nothing mm -hmm. beautiful about that, that, right. that moment. And, 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 and I've said in a number of places that, that, um, that 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 my approach to politics, in that sense, is is like how they teach kids to play the outfield in in a, in in a little league baseball, where on a deep fly fly ball you go to the wall first, and feel for the wall, and then come come back in to to the ball. So you imagine the worst possible thing that can happen, and figure out how you would adjust to that, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of I mean looking for. Um, of fantasy to get you through the night, because to me, I mean, that just feels like a dilettantish way, way, way to do politics, because you're not really committed to winning anything, and there are no stakes for you, right? Like when, what um, I mean, I have a friend who um, who uh, organized in uh, you know, Brazil under the dictatorship and the underground, right? I, I mean, there were stakes in politics then, right? I mean, um, for most of the people who read and, and engage in debates in the nation and in Jacob and, and places like, like that, the politics has no stakes. Uh, but so, and then, and, and then I have to admit this too, and like this is a safe town to admit it in, but, but the politics of um, performance of, of individual righteousness just, mm -hmm. just has always seemed distastefully Protestant to me. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like. Um, so what is what I mean, is the politics of uh, that of, of performance? That how give what, some examples? Yeah. Of what well, I mean, it's like uh, the various versions of having to take a stand, right? I mean, seeing politics like as having to take a stand about something. Um, 
uh, you know, seeing politics as a domain more for 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 personal or for for expression than for organizing for uh, colloquies of the uh, converted basically um, in contrast to find it or, or to trying to figure out ways to talk to people that don't already agree with you right that we were talking about before um, so uh, like I mean you've written about for example uh, here in New Orleans the mm -hmm. the push to take down all of the right. monuments right and uh, which I mean I don't know where you stand on actually whether you should whether you should keep them or not but mm -hmm. the, 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 the the bigger issue that you raise mm -hmm. is that we have to always orient our political program towards getting material gains for people right. and things right. that aren't getting material gains for people and that aren't linked to even theoretically some kind of program for you know actually redistributing wealth and power mm -hmm. um, they can't go anywhere ultimately right well I think that's right um, well they can't go anywhere that redounds to the benefit of the majority of working people I mean, so, um, yeah, I've been trying to think through my uh, new relationship to the statuary for, for a long time. I mean, I've, um, I had kind of a funny background, like in the sense that I'm sort of half local and half north, northeastern and for complex reasons. But, but what that meant was that I was always, even as a kid, um, a, acutely aware of all those monuments and what they stood for and hated them, right? And hated every one of them. And then I found myself, I was talking to my good friend uh, Roger Smith about this at the time, uh, that when they actually began to come down after, uh, or when the discussion about taking them down um, heated up, right, after uh, Nikki Haley um, finally took the Confederate mm -hmm. flag down from the State House grounds in you know, South Carolina, um, I found myself feeling a little be mused because obviously, right? But I'm glad they're gone, right? Every time I walk past Jeff mm -hmm. Jeff Davis yeah. and a canal, or yeah. or or you know, walking right. around the park, which was like a long block and a half from my house, uh, and and there's no PGT Beauregard, well, I'm happy, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but and so so it's better for them to come down than for them not to come down. But in mm -hmm. a way, that that celebration's uh, kind of akin to the celebration of Obama, right? In, in a couple ways. One is like, all right, so going to Obama, right? The idea that the black president was elected was like a big victory, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I guess. I mean, I know I grew up like everybody else in America saying, you know, any kid, kid can be president except the black kid. Well, but obviously, uh, demographic and ideological circumstances had changed in ways that made it possible for a black guy to get elected. So in that sense, it changed, you know, the change has already happened, right? And it's not like he was made pope, you know what I mean? Like he put together an electoral coalition in a particular set, set of historical conditions. And I still uh, would would not be surprised uh, had the bottom not fallen out of the economy at the moment that it did, that uh, you know, McCain could have won that election, uh, maybe not with, uh, with what turned out to be the colossal uh, misstep or miscue or uh, mistake of thinking that they could get like an Ellie Mae Clampett bounce from having Palin Mm. on the ticket, which was kind of cute and funny for a while, but then when the bottom fell out of the economy and, and her mulish narcissism became so, so apparent, right? Uh, but anyway, so yeah, he won and he won again, great. Um, it was good, certainly that the monuments came down, but they also came down uh, in a discourse um, of triumphant, local neoliberalism, right? Uh, that, uh, you know, the sort of links an ideal of racial justice to market idolatry, right? Uh, and it didn't have to be that way, it was that way. I mean, in the best of all possible worlds, I would have preferred something like, you know, a six months or month or a two year public information campaign about what the Confederacy was and and what the Jim Crow era was and whatnot, but I mean, you can't always have, have, have the history you want the way you want it. It's fine that it happened, but 
we also saw that the Take Him Down NOLA coalition had no other program. So once those four of the monuments came down, like all they had was taking down more of them and changing all the street names. Which at, is like every street in yeah, New Orleans. Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> pretty like, much, yeah. So your program can go on indefinitely because <laughs> well, there's no, true, no shortage can. of like... Uh, totally, totally, but... Things with racist historical associations in the South. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not, right, right. But, but the real marker of insanity was that their next big move was to take down the Jackson statue, which uh, at you know, Jackson Square, and like um, that was kind of a giveaway that they were basically uh, you know group from out of town because that image is so iconic to the entire tourist effort and has been for a century that it just was like a colossal mis misreading. But anyway, and I feel like if you adopt that, it's it, you, it's again sort of destined to be. Like I, I felt this way about um, uh, Occupy Wall Street a little bit, mm -hmm. where you're like, you know, it is something to rally around, but it, it's going, it can't end with anything. The only thing it can end with is people getting further disillusioned right. and eventually right. getting tired of it and going right. home. Because like, if you just think about, I mean, I, you know, I went to the Occupy Wall Street encampments in Boston mm -hmm. and New Haven and, at first, there was this incredible feeling, right? There was this, right. when I saw the Boston encampment, it was really, truly inspiring because you mm -hmm. see, saw all these people who had been, you know, who are my age, you know, fed up, who were defying the police, who were working together. Mm -hmm. in a, there was kind of a socialistic ethic that was right. being carried out and practiced. Um, and then when there was this resistance to making demands, putting forth a program, right. you realized that like this could go, maybe this could go on four months, maybe it could go on six right. months, right. but it's going to end with the police clearing everyone out, right. everyone going home and yep. not knowing what to do next. And right. eventually, you know, you can do, you know, 10 weekends of actions at the Jackson Square statue, but right. how long can you do it for before right. you have to go home? Well, no, that's right. Uh, no, that's exactly right. Well, yeah, the Occupy thing, thing is interesting in that regard, too. But you mentioned uh, I mean, New Haven also. Um, I was there. In fact, I was on the Yale College um, Executive Committee, which was the committee that meets out the discipline to uh, you know, undergraduates during the year of the Shantytown protest, right? Uh, in the anti-apartheid struggle. And I stopped by there uh, one day, <clears throat> um, and there was like an impromptu demo like at the quad right, right out, um, in, out behind Woolsey Hall. And students had set up shanties, right? And they lived at shanties, and they lived in the shanties, and they occupied them. And they were knocked down, and then, um, oh, yeah, the cops, uh, I mean, the cops had come through as you pointed out uh, that, that, that that's the only place or the only way this, this kind of protest can, can wind up. And this young woman um, you know, from Westchester County was uh, talking at the rally afterward about how, you know, the shanty had been their, their home and they uh, loved them. And when the police came through, it was just like South Africa, and they could feel it. They could feel like they were in Soweto or whatever. And and as I looked at her, um, you know, behind her was the gym. And as you know, behind the gym then was like the biggest housing project right. in the city where the Yale students never went. And my son was then uh, in, in high school at, at uh, Wilbur Cross. And we thought, okay, so this is like the rich Yaley, um, you know, doing a kind of, um, oppression, tourism, right? And and I wondered about that kind of thing with with respect to Occupy. The, I I began to feel otherwise. But to be completely honest, like the thing uh, before Occupy, I I had you know followed like the Arab Spring stuff mm -hmm. in the news, which always and the coverage always felt to me like I think I referred to this someplace not that long ago as like a uh, the idea of social revolution that that you take from a 1942 John Garfield movie set in Central America, right? Like the leader shows up, the people rise, the dictator goes away, and and I was very skeptical about you know the Arab Spring stuff, as I had been about all of the color, um, uh, uh, um, you know the 
color in insurgencies or in the revolutions or whatever. Because it just didn't feel right to me, right? I could never tell what the social forces were that were in motion, what the segments of, of, of the society the insurgents were aligned with, uh, and, why, and why the New York Times was so enthusiastic about it. Now I knew- <laughs> Anything the New York Times is enthusiastic about, you have to worry is about. inherently questionable. Right. Now I understood, right, because the one in Beirut was like chock full of really pretty nicely made up, I mean, upper class, largely I suspect, Maronite young, young women. So the Times would be into that. But so then, so then when the Occupy thing happened, I, I thought, oh, okay, well now this kind of makes, makes sense, right? So this is like a, a prop, partly a emergence of a cultural moment that understands political opposition mm -hmm. as, as, as this sort of activity. And uh, you know, Marcy Smith, whom I didn't know, uh, but has done a, a really great two-part piece on Gene Sharp, who I didn't know anything about either, the, the guru of, of nonviolent politics, who it turns out was always like a CIA man, basically, oh. or a, a defense intellectual. First part uh, just came out in non-site. The second part's going to be in, in uh, the next next issue of non-site, I think in August, maybe, or July. <clears throat> but anyway, so yeah, I mean, but this also seemed like performative politics, right? Like after a while, I started to refer to it as uh, Facebook farming, basically. You know, uh, you know, I spent three years at, at Yale for law school, and it's an incredible place because you basically you're in like a gilded fortress in the <laughs> middle really are, yeah. of a working class black right. city, and right. every time I see something about some political clash right. at Yale, whether it was the thing about the uh, you know the Halloween costumes and what have mm -hmm. have you, that oh, they yeah. had a big controversy right. a while back, I go, you know. We're, we're missing the fundamental yeah. dynamic of politics in New Haven, right. which is that you have this, inc this center of the American ruling class dominating everyone who actually lives in the city right. and, <laughs> and works right. Right. there. And it's astounding how it's missed. Yeah, but all the kind of patter about, uh, you know, looks at Veritas and I can't believe that, you know, uh, this august intellectual institution could be so dis disrespectful and thinking, well, it is a Yale corporation, for God's sake. Yale? Right? What right? do you expect yes. from Yale? Yeah, right. <laughs> You're not going to redeem <laughs> Yale. No, 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 absolutely not. <laughs> but there is this effort to make, I mean, and I think this uh, is another thing that you talk about a lot, which is the effort to make inherently unjust institutions look right. um, progressive and right. you know to diversify the board of Goldman Sachs so that we right. don't recognize the function and the role of Goldman right. Sachs to diversify the you know right. Elizabeth Warren just signed onto this call to have gender parity in the US yeah. military the upper echelons of the US right. military where you go like you can't fix the military right. industrial complex right. through making sure you have the right people in right. it right no no oh, no totally totally and you know this is like another marker of of the decline of the left, uh, I mean, ultimately, because so, so what, um, um, you know, my good friend Walter Michaels and I have been singing this, th this song for uh, you know, more than a decade now that the model of a just society that, that of you know, reparations um, presumes that, um, that, um, um, anti-disparitarianism presumes is that if that a society can be just if 1% of the population controls more than 90% of the good stuff provided that 1% is like 12% black 14% hispanic uh, half half women and whatever the appropriate percentage is gay and i can't say that that's not a just society i can or that that's not a legitimate model of a just society it is one legitimate model of a just society, right? Um, is it the model of a just society that mo most of us want to sign up for? Probably not. And, and, and I think that the politics that we need to cultivate as, as a left um, at this point is a politics that makes very clear that there are these two competing models of a just society 
they're not compatible except in the errant sense that sure, like if if a world in which uh, you know the the um, ruling class is diverse and the world in which the ruling class isn't diverse are the only two options. And yes, for people with egalitarian interests, the former is less obnoxious than the latter. But, but, but if people have really egalitarian interests and concerns, then the, then the proper response is to demand some other options uh, and a different understanding of, of what a just world is. And that, to me, is the um, fundamental um, political objective. Now, I mean, as I say, you spend a lot of time pointing out the various ways in which uh, different things that look like uh, political movements and political programs aren't. But, I, but I, I want to shift to and talk about what, what political action is. Mm -hmm. And, okay. you know, because it seems like you, you talk about how basically it's difficult. Doing things mm -hmm. well is difficult. It's uh, real organizing is slow. Right. It's painful. It involves making yourself uncomfortable. It involves things that really, really, are, your victories are not going to be easy. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things that um, uh, you say here in the, in the introduction to, to class notes is, you know, the movement that we need cannot be convoked magically overnight or by proxy. It can't be galvanized through proclamations, press conferences, symbolic big events, resi uh, resi uh, resolutions. It can be built only through connecting with large numbers of people in cities and towns and workplaces all over the country who can be brought together around a political agenda that speaks directly and clearly to their needs and aspirations. It's a painstaking process and it promises no guarantees of ultimate uh, victory, but there are no alternatives other than fraud, pretense, or certain failure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll stand by that. Okay. <laughs> uh, I guess I could have included self self delusion, right? Right, but it is uh, uh, with uh, fraud and pretense, but uh, to be a little more charitable. But but yeah, no, I think that's what it comes comes down to. And and look, I was just thinking about this. I mean, um, I was joking with somebody not that long ago, like on the Sanders. Camp, campaign trail. Uh, I mean, last time, uh, it it felt like a, a fair amount of my effort was um, was to try to um, e equilibrate the passions of the young, right? Because uh, really, uh, uh, what the young ex exuberant um, Bernie crats, basically, um, you know, the sort who would sort of go off after a day of canvassing and then get a tattoo on their arm. Uh, but like, um, but they tended like to ride, rise and fall, right? Like with every news report, right? Like what's happening in the Iowa polls or what um, Clinton said or, or uh, did. And, and I found myself, uh, um, this really dates me too. Uh, and, and I guess it more than dates me, but I found myself giving them the story of Sergeant Pavlov at the Battle of Stalingrad, right? That, um, that these 25 troops held a building for 58 days against multiple daily Nazi assaults. Uh, and they, um, they were focused on what their job was and their job was to hold that, that building. And, it, and like their job was, was to do whatever um, they they had to do that day in whatever locale they were working in to try to broaden the base of the campaign by a handful of people. And it didn't matter what was going on in uh, Wisconsin or what Clinton had 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 said. Um, but their their job was going to be the same no matter what, because the only way to build the campaign is through that 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 kind of work. So. But anyway, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, and, and and look, I mean, this was the, I mean, that was the ethos that we took to trying to build build the Labor Party, and um, and we held held firm on that, and we should have. Um, but like, there were a, a number of really good people whom I know, like mainly academics, but who who just couldn't understand why we were averse to trying to get coverage, like in the New York Times or whatever. And our reaction was, well because we're a working class um, initiative 
they're never going to give us good, good coverage, right? The only thing they'll ever try to do is smear us. Um, and that's not where we're going to build our base. Like, we're not going to build our base by wooing Krugman and the editorial board of the New York Times, right? We're going to build a base. And this is something that Sanders said like in, the, um, in the first debate. Like, the only way we're going to make any of this stuff that, that we want happen is to build a popular movement out there that's big enough and, and uh, you know, strong enough to, to assert its, its will in a way that can change the terms of political debate. I mean, I often point out, as, as, as did my good friend Anthony Mazaki before me, that, that for most of us who are concerned with, uh, with egalitarian interests, we actually got more from Richard Nixon than we got from any of the three subsequent I mean, Democratic presidents. And it's not because Nixon liked us, right? I'm pretty sure he hated all of us, right? Um, but, but the fact was that the balance of political and social forces in the society was such that Nixon understood that ours were interests that he had to accommodate in some way. Carter was a warm back for Reagan. Clinton was, uh, as, a, as a, you know, Thatcher has been said to have said about Blair, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but... Um, Clinton was definitely Reagan's most you know, successful product, uh, and then Obama just kind of polished it off. And it just just to be a little tendentious for mm -hmm. a second, perhaps, um, you know, there's a way that well, there are a couple ways that Obama kind of set the stage for for Trump, and it's not simply a matter of simmering white a resentment out there at the fact that they were losing their country as exemplified by this sort of black president. But it's that, um, again, uh, as um, Larry Sabato has got the best of projections on, on this, but between 6.7 and 9 million people who voted for Trump in 2016 had, had voted um, either for, or for, for Sanders and for Obama at, at, at least once. So there's a problem there, right? Uh, if it's, it's not just a race thing, but the other thing about Obama uh, that you alluded to before, but that people don't want to come, come to terms with as, as a rule, is that all he ever offered us was that he was black, right? And he proposed that he Im embodied, right? Uh, which is like racist in the original 19th century sense that he Im Im embodied the brighter futures of one's own. You're not impressed by the uh, Affordable Care Act? <laughs> <laughs> no? <laughs> well, I mean, I'd rather have it than nothing. Okay. Right. Uh, but, uh, no, no, what, well, look, like when he, he began by saying that he wouldn't accept anything that, that the insurance industry and the pharmaceutical industry barked at. Well, I mean, that's like what my dad used to call the equivalent of hiring Jesse James as a bank guard, right? I mean... And on, on that uh, last point that, that you made, another uh, thing that you talk about a lot in here, especially, and uh, you have a you have a scathing essay called uh, uh, "What Are the Drums Saying?" Oh. Book, uh, where you talk about <laughs> yeah. intellectuals that presume to speak for the black community right. and and the sort of long history of people sort of assuming an authority that isn't theirs. To, to have, right. you know, they haven't been placed right. there by a popular movement, right. um, and then it's very convenient for white liberals to embrace a figure as the authentic voice right. of black interests, mm -hmm. um, because they are a non-threatening figure to white liberals, right. who you also have some great <laughs> essays in here about, including your classic liberals I do despise, <laughs> yeah. uh, about how the fact that they would uh, rather uh, get uh, tasty scones than social justice. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the liberals thing is kind of funny, because I... Um, I was never really, well, I'll tell you what, like I've, I've, I've found that among my close political friends, they are more likely to have been people who've grown up like in red families or in Republican families. Mm. Uh, and I think that one thing that's, that they share is that uh, both, uh, despite their obvious conflicts, um, had... Uh, um, and understanding of, of what's contemptible about a lot of um, I mean, liberals. Like my dad, you know, I grew up in the McCarthy era. And my dad often said, look, you know, 
uh, I mean, liberals are people who will just sell you out as soon as times time, times get tight, right? Uh, but um, and um, but, but there is well, I mean, there's this great quote that I have actually as um, uh, as as one of the signature lines uh, on the outgoing email from from a Brecht uh, in, in in a writing the truth um, about how uh, it's a reference to people who. Um, I'm going to botch, but I'm going to butcher the quote. But so, so I won't try. But the point is that um, he doesn't call them liberals, but there's a certain, but, 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 but he says that people who um, want to object to fascism without objecting to capitalism are people who like to eat eat, eat veal, but they don't want to see the calf being butchered, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and I mean, to me, that's that's what a lot of um, liberals are, and. I mean, so what happened with me personally was that after Reagan was elected, like in 1980, I was thinking about this this morning too. Um, I mean, it's funny, like I, I, I've, um, what I've been like on an interview blitz, right? It's almost like I've got a new movie out, but I, uh, I'm not sure what's um, happened in the last month or so, a few weeks. But, um, but, but I'm probably humbled because when uh, my Du Bois book sold out the, fir uh, the hardcover run of 2000, in, in a year, um, um, uh, uh, my editor at the press was so enthusiastic that it happened. He said to me, like, you have to understand, for a political theory book, this is like gone with the wind. So my expectations of what he ought to be for my popularity. But, but, but anyway, I mean, um, um, when it became clear, so when Nixon was elected in 68, and even when he was elected in 72, it, it wasn't... Uh, um, he didn't follow through with all the big right wing promises that he mm -hmm. made. And I noticed that a lot of people uh, among um, you know, liberal you know, political elites, but I think a lot of uh, the rest of us, too, had been kind of lulled to sleep about Reagan, sort of expecting that he'd be another version of the same thing. Right. That the mm -hmm. that the post-war consensus had had held held well enough um, that. That, that the rupture wasn't going to be complete. Well, then when it became clear that, that they were trying to make it complete, that, see, this time I was, no, that time I was in my early 30s, and I thought, okay, well, I need to figure out how, another way to try to deal, deal with liberals, right? And I began uh, to vote more consistently as a Democrat and you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and that lasted um, through, through the 80s. And what happened... Right, even before Clinton was, when underclass ideology right began to take shape mm -hmm. as um, as a way of understanding inequality and and economic in, in, injustice that was culturalized and thereby racialized. And can you yeah. maybe just say what you mean by oh, under, sure. underclass ideology? Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, it's so. Um, I'm gonna. With your leave, uh, do um, a little bit of what my grandmother used to refer to as you know, going all around uh, the Robin Hood's barn. But um, so by the end of World War II, right, um, racialist or, or e explicitly racialist uh, biologistic e explanations of inequality had fallen out of favor, like in the US and most of the West, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so there's kind of a moment there, like in the early 50s, when, when it wasn't clear how governing elites were going to justify like inequality, right? To put it kind of uh, you know, simplistically. But by the mid or early late 50s, um, from, from a couple of different directions, culturalist right, explanations mm -hmm. of naturalized inequality began to take the place of biologistic ones. And, and the way the ideological uh, I mean, mechanism works, I mean, nobody really lay, laid it out because it's not the kind of thing that can work if you theorize it, right? Mm -hmm. But as a common sense, um, ra race is biology, as, um, and as Mr. Mackey you know, South Park would say, uh, and, and biology, bad, okay? So I mean, don't do race. Culture, though, is something different, right? Because it's ambiguously enough not race, mm -hmm. right, or not biology, or it can be and 
and can not be. Um, so it's like um, a Neil Lamarckian thing, basically. Late 50s, um, uh, Oscar Lewis, like from anthropology, and Edward Banfield from, from a political science, and, and, and Soch began laying out um, social scientistic seeming accounts of, um, of the intergenerational I mean, reproduction of poverty in, in, in various bounded contexts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then by the early 60s, then the culturalist understandings of, uh, of, of long-term unemployment, poverty, and uh, the persistent economic in, inequality get embedded, uh, ironically, within the war on poverty programs, where, where there were two contending schools, one of which was the old school, um, you know, New Deal types who thought, well, the way to fight poverty is at, uh, ra raise the minimum wage, mm -hmm. encourage unionization, and put people to work, like in, yeah. in the jobs programs. The social activist wing, ironically, uh, with, with, with its feet in the Ford Foundation, said, no, 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 people are poor because um, they're, they're um, you know, demoralized and they um, um, are in, incapable, or, or no, they lack um, civic efficacy, so we need to in, engage them. So anyway, participation becomes an, an alternative to redistribution. Mm -hmm. All right. As, 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 we were, as we retreat um, from expansion of, of the social welfare state over the 70s, by the end of the decade, um, the Ken, Ken Alwetta, the journalist, actually starts it off, at, at, and he sort of, through a series of essays, I think in the Atlantic, or, or perhaps in New Yorker, um, does a feature on what he calls the urban underclass. Mm -hmm. And it's really cultural poverty. It's, it's like, you know, sturdy beggar. It's like all the rest of that crap, uh, but, but with, with a new label. But it becomes... Um, and a, a, a useful condensation symbol for liberals, right? For for post-Keynesian liberals, um, to converge around um, um, positive valorization of a punitive social welfare policy mm -hmm. by calling it, I mean, something else. Yeah. Well, one of the things that it's to me when I, I so I did a book on 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 Bill Clinton. Oh yeah, called, right. Super That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. One of the most remarkable way. things yeah. that I found was he gave a speech to a black audience where mm -hmm. he goes, "Look how disappointed Martin. Think how disappointed Martin Luther King would can be you in imagine? you." <laughs> and you yeah. Think, no. Can you imagine? And you, you yeah. Know, like that is that is just jaw dropping. But there is this right. kind of thing that takes that takes hold as as, as being completely legitimate right. with the cultural explanations of poverty and the feel and the and the idea that. You know, it's that hectoring people about their personal behavior right. and giving messages of uplift is, is socially beneficial, right. and therefore that everyone, you know, this is the, this is the good liberal thing to do. Right. Well, uh, uh, no, it's extraordinary. Uh, yeah, I mean, it really is. And I mean, that was like um, my break with the liberals finally, uh, and also with like a lot of the left because, or or, or like a strain of the left because people. Wanted to understand uh, William Julius Wilson, the black sociologist who gave like um, um, a legitimizing patina in dark hue to underclass ideology, because both because he was black, of course, and because he described himself as a social democrat, whatever that meant, mm -hmm. meant like in his head. Um, so, and then that's when you see like um, a, a fundamental. Um, ambiguity uh, that, or, or rather, an ambiguity that sort of cloaked a fundamental uh, uh, disagreement about what people meant by structure, right? So the so the underclass ideologues and 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 the liberals who took their cues from them and gave them their cues um, used structure to basically talk about durable patterns of behavior, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they wouldn't cop to it ultimately. Where you know some of the rest of us thought thought of structure as as a referring to political economic tendencies, and they couldn't see the difference. A lot of them couldn't, and and even a fair amount of people who consider themselves Marxists couldn't see that distinction. So then, I, so by the mid '90s, by this point, then I'm really thinking, uh, 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 all right, there's something totally rotten, like in a you know, left intellectual life. 
Well, what, to adjust the quote, it's hard to get someone to recognize a power structure right. when their very existence yep. depends on the well, perpetuation of that power structure. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I mean, that's it. Well, I mean, I remember once, like, I was at a dinner party at the home of some really good, good friends in Berkeley, and they had another guest or some other guests there, who, one of whom was like, um, was like, um, I, I think, um, a, well, well, an academic of some sort who, who was friendly with a, with another um, academic who was like a former SDS guy, right? Who, and that's part of his bona fides. It wasn't Gitlin, but but like anyway, the friend's friend asked me if I knew this guy, and I, and we just had an exchange actually. And I said, Yeah, I know. I mean, and the thing that strikes me about him is that he's. He's got his tongue so far up Bill Bill Wilson's ass he can taste his colon polyps. Well, that's vivid. That's <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, probably gonna have to come out. But anyway, uh, <laughs> remarkably colorful. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean that's a no. I mean that's the thing. And, and I mean that's so. Um, and and watching how 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 many nominal left liberal um, academics. Uh, made made clear that they would abide any um, Clintonism, right, um, for the for the sake of being holding out the possibility of being clo close close to power, right? I mean, uh, yeah, well, Jesse Jackson is a key, yeah, right. key example of that. No, no, right? absolutely. Uh, you know, begins as a critic of the Clinton administration, right. then you know has, uh, I mean. I, I seem to remember that Jesse Jackson was very critical of Bill Clinton when he executed Ricky Ray Rector, he and was, then you yes. know a few years later finds right. himself as the president's personal right. advisor and confidant. Right. Well, no, that's right. And and uh, by the way, people forget that the that the first lady's personal advisor, and sorry, spiritual advisor was none other than Marianne Williamson. Oh, uh, yeah. I didn't know that either. Yeah. So it's nice to sort of keep 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 Cult all the balls in the air. Yeah. How? Well, yeah. well, yeah. The fantasy of of a whispering in the prince's ear is just all up and down academic life. You know that, right? I mean, you, well, you see it all the time. Yeah, uh, you, you definitely do. And um, I mean, you saw this with some people during the Obama years too, yeah, totally. where it was yeah. you could either, if you were someone like Michael Eric Dyson, or right. you were someone, you know, right. it, it was very tempting to take the White House. Or, I, even, well. There's never any hope for David Brooks, but he was a regular. You know, Obama said he, you know, he never made a decision without right. looking at what David Brooks had to say. Oh you, my God! Seriously, she, I, I think didn't know that. I, I, I don't want to misquote, but there's yeah. like, he's he was definitely a reader. Well, uh, well, it's in keeping, right? I mean, with, with his like, character, Jesus. right? Well, and look, I mean, since we're beating on Obama, I'll just say this too. But, but, yeah, why not? Um, uh, I mean, I understand that he got this um, team of rivals thing, like from Garth. Uh, Nip and Doris Kearns, good one. But, but the idea that what stands out about Lincoln is that he brought people together when he presided <laughs> over the, the 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 most intense conflict in the history of the country. Also, team of rivals is a terrible idea, yeah, right. generally. Oh, like no, when, it really is. And also, right. and also, they weren't even his rivals. He was completely in sympathy, in sympathy oh, right. with right. all That's of right. the. You know, yeah. it wasn't actually a team of rivals no, that Obama appointed. Right. That assumes that Obama didn't like all the Goldman Sachs guys, right. and that Larry Summers <laughs> wasn't, a, you know, dear friend Tim Guyton. Right. Like he got along great with those right. people. They That's weren't right. rivals. That's yep. again this illusion that Obama was kind of a secret leftist. Right. Right. Yeah. So there we go. How much? Uh, how much potential do you think that Bernie Sanders has? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I mean, I go back and forth. I mean, and in keeping with the Pavlov uh, analogy before, um, the longer, and I felt the same way, like in 2016. Like the longer that the campaign is alive and viable, uh, the more opportunities we have, like to organize through it and underneath it to try to build a popular base around the issues, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, Sanders understands that too, right? Um, this time, um, it's, it's also pretty clear, right, that all the rest of the field um, is more committed to defeating the left. I won't just say Bernie, but to defeating the left than they are to defeating Trump. And that certainly makes sense. Right. I mean, given what we know about mo most of the rest of the field, um, 
and um, and I think um, I think it's way too soon to say, right? Like mm -hmm. we're not going to know I mean, anything really until votes start coming in. And um, it's funny, like I worked uh, in the Harkin campaign in uh, in '92 um, and knew Clinton's administration or. or Clintonism pretty well, but um, one of the things that struck me was how um, the national um, media apparatus, right, the chattering class, kept raising the threshold of, of, of significance of any Harkin victory, right? So, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, New, New Hampshire, which was, you know, as you know, the most conservative primary, didn't or accounted for everything. No matter what he did in Iowa, didn't count. No matter what he did in Minnesota, didn't count because he was close to Wellstone. No matter what he did, like in South Dakota, didn't count. They do this for Bernie, where they say, yeah. you know, they said, uh, you know, only this many our revolution can endorsed candidates won. Right. Oh yeah, and you right. and and they and they move the goalposts so that you go, right. none of these people would have won several years ago. Right, like no, they're right. building slowly, right. and then they're going, look, only only half, and right. you go, whoa. This is a massive improvement, yes. and you're portraying it as a failure. Yeah, no, no, exactly. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, um, um, I, I just a few days ago to myself, I haven't even mentioned it to my. Well, no, I think I did mention it to my son because because he'd appreciate this too. Um, you know, propounded what I've called um, um, uh, the Bill Buckner front of politics, which is uh, you know, Bill Bill Buckner was like the first baseman uh, on the. Uh, Red Sox 1986 team. Uh, the Red Sox were up uh, you know, three games to two or whatever, and uh, and uh, the Mookie Wilson hit like a slow dribbler through Buckner's. Well, I know this because he was on Cover Enthusiasm. Right. Bill Buckner was on. Oh, oh no, no. <laughs> that's uh, how I know. Th yeah. That's how I know who that is. Uh, Don't follow yes, baseball right. at all. But <laughs> and, and and he died not that long ago. But but the point is that uh, you know once you put the ball in play, anything can happen. Okay. Right. Uh, so, yeah. so the thing for us is, is, is to keep the ball in play and like be prepared. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, on the one hand, be, uh, uh, I mean, I do think actually that, that, that Sanders has the best chance to beat Trump, right, among mm -hmm. the Democrats. That's not to say that, that he'll win the nomination. Um, we should, you know, we have to be prepared for it I mean, um, I mean, either way, but no matter what, right, if, if, if the most optimistic possibilities come to fruition, on January 20th, 2021, um, he, he would win. He, he would have a legislative agenda that's going to have to be fought for mm -hmm. and fought for hard, right? I mean, we saw right. uh, what the healthcare industry in uh, Massachusetts did to the Safe Staffing Initiative, right? And it was, and see, this is where, you know, the, the, the distinctions between politics as as an electoral undertaking and politics as like a moving uh, movement building enterprise bump up against each other because um, you know the safe staffing um, ballot measure was polling um, yes yes voters by like a twenty point margin uh, and then the insurance company began the insidious campaign right um, and and, and, and it lost. And I mean, it's just not that simple, right? And this is another problem with too many people on, uh, on the left, the notion that, um, uh, I mean, it's really like um, a tabula rasa, right? I mean, um, I'm understanding about um, politi people's political in inclinations, right? But um, but but this fantasy, and, you know, this is like the the Greens fantasy that if we could just get the right candidate who articulates the right program, then the people will see and will win. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of unlearning that has to go on. And the only way that the unlearning can can go on really is um, through uh, repeated connections with people who have standing in your own world. Yeah, I, I just want to finish up here by mm -hmm. uh, talking about what it actually takes. And you know, you write in class notes about you you give uh, you recount some of your own organizing experience at the end in the uh, GI coffee house mm -hmm. movement, where you talk about you know 
as I say, that, that difficult reality of what it takes to achieve small goals and you know, talking to people, mm -hmm. converting people one by one. And right. you know, the word organizing is easy to say, right. but I think often people go, oh, we gotta, we gotta organize, we gotta organize without, right. no, you know, and so maybe you could say what that actually yeah. means in practice. Sure, well, I mean, like a lot of times people think, think it's something that involves a bullhorn. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, now what I mean to me, like it's fundamentally a matter of um, establishing relationships with people, building standing with them and, and uh, how you create standing with them is like I mean, if you're in a workplace, then th then the people who what I mean, there are people around. Uh, I mean, I know you mentioned Jane, Jane before we went on the air, but there are people around who have standing among their fellow workers because they're dependable, they're, 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 they're trustworthy, and their fellow workers think of them as, um, as sources of good judgment they can tap into. And it's the same thing like in other areas, um, too. I mean, so um, showing um, you know, that, 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 you're, uh, that you will act solidaristically with, with with people about mm -hmm. their own struggles, right? About their own concerns. And then that's how you build, build a relationship of standing, right? I mean, they'll trust you, they'll pay attention to you, right? Um, and they'll listen to you. And, and of course, part of that means, uh, I mean, listening to them to find ways to connect the large political programs that you wanna move meaningfully to people's own concerns, right? Uh, and then you broaden the base, right? And you just keep trying to broaden the base. So, uh, but I've sometimes joked that, that, that it can be a little bit like selling Amway, right? Because what you're trying to do is make connections uh, to bring more, more and more people into uh, you know, the common project of, of advancing the agenda. And it doesn't, I mean, um, I'm every now and then, uh, and especially if there's some Trotskyists like in the room, the party question comes up to me it, it um, i think that's 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 a premature question because you know the issue of what sort of um um structures mm -hmm. um should guide a struggle have to grow out of the struggle itself right i mean it's one thing there's a union because the union is there um but 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 the question of whether or not we need to have a left party or 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 a socialist party, or what kind of party? It just all seems premature to me, right? I mean, because the, um, I mean, the entities like we created the Labor Party at a particular moment, uh, you know, out of a particular set of concerns and and concatenation of forces. We were never committed to it in a reified way. So therefore, mm -hmm. when it wasn't able. Well, when the circumstances changed, like the structure wasn't able to do the work anymore, like we put it in mothballs, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but so, I mean, that's so. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, I mean, what I like about your uh, work is that even though you're <laughs> scathingly critical of a number of things that people are invested in, it can be quite shocking sometimes reading um, uh, what you have to say. You know, you constantly drawing our attention to substance over form mm -hmm. right yeah. uh, don't it doesn't matter so much uh, you know and 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 over procedure and right. and constantly drawing our attention to the question what is your strategy how are you going right. to get things done how are you going to get more people what are you going to get for those people right and i, I like that because it's so easy to get i mean right now there's a controversy over like nike putting out some sneakers oh with God. the betsy yeah. ross flag and right. oh colin kaepernick and right. mitch mcconnell's involved and that can all like right. people start talking about it and it feels almost like right. politics right yes but <laughs> feels almost like politics that's right <laughs> but but you go through here and you're constantly like, you know, Million Man March, what is it doing? You right. know, you know, yeah. Louis Farrakhan, what is he, yeah. you know, uh, what does he actually stand for? All of these things. And, you know, and you have this lovely thing at the end where you talk about what solidarity actually mm -hmm. is. 
And you say, it's not, it's not just a slogan, it's not just an ethical statement, it is a prescription for action. Right. And we, are, we have to treat injuries uh, to anyone, even those we don't like, as har harmful to all if we're going to maintain unity. And I like that because you're constantly saying, you're constantly talking about like, what is, what is the action and what mm -hmm. is the program? Well, I try, that's all I can say. <laughs> Well, I think Class Notes, what's great about Class Notes is about the, a lot of the controversies of the 1990s, but it's uh -huh. still, you know, uh, as you can tell from the, from the Obama portion, still very relevant. Uh, where can people read your latest? Uh, well, let's see. That's a good question. Well, uh, well <laughs> actually, like, I'm going to be starting a column in the New Republic every other month. Oh, nice. Uh, the first They've changed the New Republic. Uh, bit, yeah, they bit. really have. Uh, yeah, I mean, it used to be they wouldn't even let people like me buy it. <laughs> right? and, then, uh, and then they moved back a little bit, and then they moved back back, uh, back the other way. But Chris, Chris Lehman is the new editor, mm -hmm. so that's good. Oh, great. Yeah, uh, and um, I think my first column is going to be on the myth of class reductionism. It won't be out till October, but, 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 but that's a nice thing to plug. Um, and then Nonsite has an archive of uh, a lot of the yeah, stuff you've written right. over, the, over the last and, couple yeah, of years. Yeah, and actually, um, like the late great American historian, uh, Najuda Stein, who died a couple of years ago, uh, we're actually um, at the beginning of a three, um, um, of a three edition homage to her, like in, in, uh, in Nonsite. Um, and yeah, I mean, people are like interested. I've, I've, I've done a fair, fair amount of stuff in Nonsite over the years, most recently, a, piece called What a Materialist Black Political History look, uh, uh, Would Look Like. Uh, and I'm finally, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm on the, uh, by the end of the calendar year, one way or another, I'm going to be finished this, the book formerly known as Obama Mania, now called something like Decline and Transformation of the U.S. Left. And I have to recommend that everyone pick up Current Affairs magazine Indeed. and read it and subscribe. Um, and I'll double down on that. And uh, great, yeah, we have a one of our books has a glowing endorsement from uh, oh. Professor Reed. Oh, so oh, you, oh wait, you, kind of, you gave us a you gave us a really nice blurb. Uh, uh, the current affairs mindset you gave us. A, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 totally. That uh, yeah, it's absolutely <laughs> so correct. It comes and your book, uh, I mean, the Clinton book is great. But I want to say this too, like the thing that that hooked me and reeled me in, like the current affairs, was that fabulous piece on the West Wing. Right. Well, this is by uh, Luke Savage, uh, right. exploring yeah, no. the, and it was interesting that everything he said was confirmed when I read the Obama, the memoirs from the Obama oh. administration oh, staffers, yeah, because they all said, and that's a great I developed essay my too idea. That you did too. I developed yeah. my idea of politics from the West Wing. Wow. That's what they all Man, say. That's amazing. Which that got got us totally, totally amazing. It's it really does explain so much when right. you watch that show. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I I I remember mean, thinking because I could never watch more than like. Um, I think maybe I, 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 I watched enough minutes to have seen two episodes over the totality of the show because I hated it so much. But, but especially spending time, time in D.C., I mean, you could really see how much for this, 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 this strain of liberals, right? And especially that strain, strain of liberals that, um, that uh, Luke uh, wrote, wrote about, uh, for whom it's all about uh, the winning, uh, I mean, the conversation. Like for them... Um, Bartlett was what they wanted Clinton to have mm -hmm. been, and it's just. But the the great point that he makes in the essay is even when they had their fantasy president, mm -hmm. he still didn't accomplish right. anything. No, no, Bartlett that was actually wonderful. Actually, doesn't <laughs> accomplish right. any substantive right. transformations. They have their dream, but their dream <laughs> is literally just the highest aspiration is getting right. all the good people with right. the good educations to be in right. office, and so that they can win the conversation. Yeah. No, that's it. That's exactly it. It's hideous. Hideous. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Professor. Reed. Oh, thank you very much.